Okay, right. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Sait, and I am one of the international consultants at GL Education. Um, I work with schools across the South and Southeast Asia, um, helping them to understand how to get the most out of our assessments. Uh, I'm a former teacher myself, having spent 10 years in, in various teaching and, and leadership uh, roles, uh, and now work with teachers to kind of help them use our assessments. Um, I'm delighted today to be able to welcome not just one, but two guests, um, Dr. Tassos and Teachner, who um, at this webinar today will be um, talking about their experiences of, of using our, um, our assessments. So I'll just quickly pass over to, to Dr. Tassos and Teachner, who will uh, just quickly introduce themselves. Thank you, Peter. And um, I'm very pleased that you've decided to make time to join us. Um, I've, I've now been involved in uh, GL assessments and using these assessments for perhaps over 15 years uh, globally. So I'm bringing the global perspective and um, I'm really sold by the potential of these uh, assessments and the value they've got on teaching and learning. And I've invited Tichina to give you the, the local perspective. I'm, I'm new at Genesis um, Global School and we've just started using them. I, I also use them in in Mumbai for a couple of years, but Tishna is here to actually give you the, the pro, uh, you know, the, the, the India pro, pro, perspective. Pro, perspective. Yeah. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tassos. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Tishna, and I'm uh, an IB educator teaching uh, in an IB school since last five years, uh, five years. And here at Genesis, I got an opportunity to work as a leader for assessment and handling GL uh, assessments in our school. So we are really looking forward to it and we are pleased uh, that GL has given us the, the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. We are looking forward to the uh, event webinar. Thank you both. That's great, thank you. Uh, and thank you again to everyone who's joined today. Um, I hope you find it useful. Uh, whether you're an existing uh, user of our assessments or just interested to learn a little bit about more about our assessments or just to listen to some wise words from our, our uh, guests here today. Um, finally, just to say there is a Q&A box you'll see at the bottom. So if you do have any questions uh, throughout today's webinar, please do put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try and get through those before the end of today's webinar. Great, so just uh, a quick uh, introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, GL Education. Um, so we, we are a trusted provider of standardized assessments. We've been going on for a long time now, uh, over 40 years, uh, working with thousands of schools um, across over 100 countries. Uh, and we'll continue to kind of invest and develop our assessment to support the needs of schools and teachers. Mostly we are a, a team of former educators and, and teachers ourselves, so we're all very passionate about helping schools and staff uh, to ensure that the children at their schools thrive and succeed. So just to start off with today then, so first question uh, for, our, for our guests, um, you know, Tassos, you're an experienced uh, educator yourself. Yeah. Um, can you firstly just share your experience of using, uh, of using GL Education? Yes, I mean, it goes back many years, um, back to when we started with the progress tests, when we were looking at progress in mathematics, Eng English and science. And many years ago, it was really uh, quite focused on the na English national curriculum at, at that time. Um, and then the CAT4 was beginning to become understood. And I think my experience was that the CAT4 was beginning to be seen as more of a, an ability and potential. Uh, I won't use the, the word test because still there's that perception of, of test in it. Um, I used it particularly in the UAE and um, what we wanted to measure in the UAE was progress, not just attainment. And what we found was that the CAT4 and the progress tests in combination were a wonderful measure of progress and were eventually accepted by the KHGA, that's the inspection team in, in Dubai um, for the measurement of progress annually. Um, in addition, I've used other products such as the PASS, the Attitudes to Learning, which we can discuss later on. Um, and then something that I'm very passionate about is literacy, 
the NGRT, which you can take more regularly um, and you can actually see much more rapid progress if you intervene um, and take the test perhaps two or three times per year. It's actually an incredibly valuable tool for the student, for the parents and for the teachers. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that leads on nicely to kind of what we're going to be looking at today, because like you said, you're you know, a big believer and very passionate about literacy and, and the NGRT is, is one of the assessments we're going to we're going to talk about today so just uh, just a quick um few key points that we're going to hopefully cover in in today's session so uh, just a brief outline of some of our core assessments uh, and what data they provide so specifically we're going to be looking at the cap4 uh, and the ngrt uh talking a bit about the value of using those assessments uh, and their impact and then also kind of talking about those conversations, those difficult conversations that you have with, with parents and maybe touch on with staff potentially as well. Um, like I said, we are focusing on two assessments today, but we do have lots of assessments at GL, range of assessments um, that look at different aspects um, of the student to generate that whole student view. And although we're only looking at the CAT4 and NGRT, um, it's obviously important when you're looking at uh, data with students to get, as, to get as much data as possible as much information as possible and not just use kind of one bit or one piece of data in isolation. Um, but like I said, today we're going to focus on the CAT4 uh, and the NGRT. So firstly, in terms of the CAT4, uh, just a little bit of information to start off with. So the CAT4 is a curriculum neutral assessment. Um, and it does look at potential, does look at ability uh, of the students. It is an assessment, like I said, of developed abilities and an indicator of academic potential. And like Dr. Tassel said, it's not an attainment test. Um, it is available from the age of six and it is curriculum neutral, which is key. You know, again, sometimes a, a misconception that it's only for, for schools following the UK national curriculum um, when it's not. Um, we do also have a CAT4 CBSE uh, version as well, uh, just to say. Uh, and the CAT4 uh, UK version and the CBSE version is a standardized assessment. Uh, it is compared against thousands of other students uh, of the same age, okay, which is really important. So what does it involve? Um, the CAT4 consists of, of four key, uh, what we call batteries, that assess the main types of mental processing. So verbal reasoning is, is the first one there. So that's uh, thinking with words. Um, that's the only battery out of the four that does require kind of a knowledge and understanding of, of the English language. The other three do not. So we've got quantitative reasoning, which is thinking with numbers. We have the nonverbal reasoning, which is thinking with shape and pattern uh, and spatial reasoning, which is thinking with shapes and space, kind of visualize uh, shapes and, and, and patterns in, in three dimensions. So obviously, Tassel, as you mentioned about, obviously, you know, you worked in many schools uh, previously and, and, and CAT4 is definitely kind of one of those that's, that's a, lot of our, a lot of our schools that we work with use. So can you just talk me through maybe your experience of using specifically CAT4 and, and those kind of misconceptions that you might have had to address with maybe even parents or staff uh, during that time? I think, I think yes. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the fact that it's not an attainment measure and particularly useful in schools where English may be a second language or third language. Uh, because in my experience in working in international schools, sometimes attainment is limited by the verbal aspect. So where we've identified a CAT4 result where the nonverbal, the spatial and the quantitative are very high, but the verbal is low, this is where it becomes very, very useful uh, because intervention in verbal, and this is why I pair it up with the NGRT and possibly the progress in English, can be very rapid. And what we find is, particularly in subjects that require oracy, literacy, presentation skills, um, and increasing more so in many subjects now, especially with 21st century skills where you have to talk about things, analyze describe your language is important yeah 
So the three batteries that are very high can lead to a lower attainment because of your language element. So you might have a high functioning spatial nonverbal quantitative learner that is getting low attainment. And that's where the wake up call happens when you see the cat four and it's actually the verbal uh, that's limited. We can speak a bit later about other aspects of, of teaching and learning, but that's one area. The other area is really the process. Um, is a bit scary. And this is something that teaching can probably describe of, of taking the tests in practical terms um, and the challenges we faced in terms of, uh, do you want to speak about that a bit? Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Dr. Passos. So in uh, in context of uh, where we are, and especially uh, as Dr. Passos rightly said, uh, usually people uh, uh, misinterpret it as uh, an attainment test rather than abilities it is an, all about abilities so they uh, they they had a misconception whether they have to prepare for the test uh, is it based on some curriculum that they have read and they have to they have to prepare or go through a sample for to appear for the test however for cognitive abilities test we do not require any preparation it is all about abilities and if we do so they result won't be authentic. So that was uh, one uh, we came across during our experience. Yeah, and um, even even parents, because we share it with parents, I mean, I haven't experienced this here, but in previous schools I have, well, we share it with parents and they see that um, maybe there's a battery low or the cat for the four sc score is not as they expected in the gifted area. Um, they demand a retake and um, in all my experience other than if the child was sick and there was an extenuating circumstance the retake has validated actually that the result um, was authentic and also um, it's actually a wake-up call which we can discuss a bit later for the parents who really know their children um, so it actually validates um, it takes away this misconception and I know that's going to come up a little bit later. The other thing is um, the anxiety about the test time. And I've experienced this here more than anywhere else, um, particularly in the, in the primary years. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that, right? Be able to sit for that long duration because these are in three parts for five minutes each. However, they can take breaks, but that is also one, one aspect they consider they are hesitant about. And um, I mean, different schools have got different cultures. In, in some schools, asking a child to sit down for 45 minutes and, and actually do an assignment is, is, is normal and would be challenging. We're very much a PYP school, which is inquiry-based learning. So I suppose that the students aren't used to sitting around for a long amount of time. So we're beginning, you know, that is a challenge for us, and we're looking at ways of overcoming it to involve the primary students as well. That's great. Thank, thank you for so much. That was that was really useful. So I think, again, one of the key things you said there about, you know, it's it's not something that, that students should be worried about or, or should be worried about kind of revising for. It's not it's not that it's not that type of uh, assessment. I know a lot of students get concerned with with when we talk about when we say the word assessment or test um and they, they want to try and do as preparation for that don't they but the cat four is not is not that um so yeah that's really useful thank you um one of the things i, I mentioned previously that the about the cat four is a is a standardized uh test so um what that means is we've basically taken the cat four results of, of thousands of students and plotted their results to get this distribution curve, which you can kind of see here. Um, and what you will get is the, the, from that, the standard age score. And that's probably the most important piece of information um, from any uh, kind of standardized test. And the standard age score, the SAS score, um, is based on the student's raw score, uh, simply the number of marks uh, gained, which has been adjusted for age uh, and placed on a scale that makes a, uh, a comparison with the standardized standardization sample uh, of those students. And it's the fairest way to kind of compare performance of, of different students over time uh, across groups or even individuals as well. But the average score you'll see there is, is 100. Whoops, 
to go back to that one. So the average score uh, is there a hundred, um, and we also have the the average band and the scale that we have is between uh, eighty nine and one hundred eleven. So that's the the average band there that you can see there in the middle. Uh, most students will probably lie within this average band between and have a score between eighty nine and one hundred eleven, um, but you will also have many well a few students probably above and below average so between 112 to the maximum 141 and below that down to 59. We also have the uh, stay nine scores which is one to nine so the ST the stay nine scores uh, stands for standard nine and that just provides a broad overview of performance and just as a scale score from from one to nine where nine is always the highest and one is the lowest. Now, when the students complete the CAT4 assessment, you will get lots of information from that. Uh, and there's lots of different reports that you can generate as well. Um, within those reports, it gives you information about what each part means. So here's just an example um, where you'll see the SAS score that's that's, uh, that's mentioned there, the, also the STAY9 score uh, to the right. But there's also other bits of, of really useful information that you can get from this in terms of things like the number of questions that the students answered, um, their group ranking uh, as well. Again, lots of useful information, but the reports will help you to understand that data um, as well. So we mentioned a bit about the, the CAT4 uh, assessment there, uh, Dr. Tassos. So basically, why, you, why use it? What's the point of, of using the CAT4 uh, assessment? Okay, so, I mean, the obvious reason is that enabling every student to maximise their progress using yeah. their talents. And that's key. And um, as teachers, sometimes... Um, we don't actually look at the learning potential of every student, particularly higher up where um, it gravitates more towards the teacher speaking and the student listening, although it shouldn't be, but there is no doubt that as we go up towards GCSE and A-level and DP, teachers talk a lot more. And I think really that's where the cut for, I find is much more useful because you've got the quiet child in the background that is listening and is a is a spatial learner perhaps verbal is a bit low um and the teacher doesn't realize it and maybe not doing well in tests right because they're formalized tests so the cap four then identifies very very quickly that actually this child is perhaps spatial non-verbal very high very gifted very low verbal. And so unless you change the teaching style and the access to learning and the way you assess this child, the child is always going to underachieve. So the CAP4 actually gives a teacher the potential to unlock learning potential. And that's so critical as the students get older because still um, testing even though in the IB and NYP uh, we're beginning to look more at evidence-based, there is no doubt that still uh, there is a system that achievement is measured by tests. And not every student, according to the CAT4, can achieve well in tests. But however, if you identify the issue early enough, then you can provide scaffolding for those students who you know are very high thinkers, high level thinkers, so that they can perform better in the tests. The other area is behavioral. We very quickly label students as hyperactive um, or they can't sit still or, um, you know, many other, many other reasons that we, we label them as learning support. Now the CAT4 identifies, first of all, any weak batteries. Um, if the verbal is very, very low, they're just probably not understanding and able to express themselves very well. So they get frustrated and that this uh, results in behavior. The quiet child, the very, very quiet child, who's never challenged and just never says anything because they've got it, the perceptive is very high, they've got it, they just remain quiet, seem uninterested. Many, many other examples where it gives you a light 
as a teacher on the child and what to do with the child. Most behavioural issues, most behavioural issues are due to undermotivation, the wrong uh, type of stimulus material, the teacher talking too much, or perhaps the children can't understand and are, are motivated by the learning material. So the CAP4 is an enormous eye opener for teaching and learning. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I would add a few points uh, to Dr. Tasso's, uh, as rightly mentioned. So it uh, enables the teachers to enhance the curriculum as well, what they are practicing, how they can improvise it. First, and then personalize the learning experience for that for this uh, learner based on their uh, report and the analysis that uh, we uh, we receive. And then what happens? Then we can elevate the uh, learning and teaching process both, which will be beneficial for all the uh, parties involved. And I found it very useful in the IP, where they have to do presentations and they can have formative assessments when suddenly you've realized that these children are very highly motivated when they're up in front of the class, project-based learning, displaying, talking, discussing, not so good at tests, mm -hmm. and suddenly their marks go from a four to a six, yeah. right? because actually you've given the opportunity to speak, discuss critical thinking. So very valid, but that's, that's really, I mean, honestly, I can't, I can't see a school functioning effectively. I know this is a bit strong, without having a cognitive ability to test. And I feel quite passionately about that. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, th there are so many um, benefits and, and of the CAP4 assessment, and you've mentioned so many there that, that some I'll just quickly touch on again. And um, and, in, and to identify that, that hidden potential uh, of those students, to understand them further, and to help those teachers in the classroom, to help those teachers... Um, adapt their their teaching and their their teaching styles and their resources and what they're doing in the lesson to help support those students and that's and that's really important and that's what the the cat four assessment will will shine a light on and enable those teachers to do and hopefully then those students will be able to perform to their to their maximum potential um so yeah no, that's great i mean you mentioned quite a lot of these i'm going to quickly run through um uh, just now but one of the the key things yes identify those strengths uh, of the students uh, with those scores. So you can see here, um, this particular student, again, you'll get a standard age score for each of the four batteries that I mentioned before. And you can see here that this particular student had a higher spatial score of 120, which is which is above average. So a spatial score, kind of thinking with, with shapes and space. So this student, in terms of their strengths, they could be directed towards uh, STEM subjects, um, because that might be an area of strength and interest uh, for them kind of going forward. On the, on the opposite side, on the opposite scale, you've got uh, potentially identify the weaknesses or where students potentially need extra support. Um, so this student here in their profile, you can see that their verbal SAS score still within the average band. So the average band between 89 and 111, but compared to the other scores, so the quantitative, nonverbal and spatial, you can see those scores are a lot higher. Um, so what that's probably likely to mean is that this students uh, their English skills aren't as as developed yet but they're likely to kind of develop quite rapidly um, with the right support uh, and with that support the student has the potential to do very very well um, looking at their their other uh, standard age scores there it will also help to identify those learning styles uh, that you mentioned as well so again this uh, this image here shows that um, this particular student has a slight uh, spatial bias uh, to the uh, to the right hand side uh, so in that purple section there so that might mean the student is kind of better engaged in uh, tasks that require kind of visualization or um, perform better using kind of pictures and diagrams and the reports generated from the cat4 will allow you to have a look at that so again it will help teachers when when planning their lessons uh, to help support those students and adapt to help them uh, and again make sure those students uh, access the curriculum and achieve their potential. The other thing that the CAT4 will provide, it will provide grade indicators, whether that's at uh, GCSE or IB, so that's uh, middle years or diploma. And if you do the CAT4 CBSE, it will also provide indicators for either grade 10 or 12. 
And just to remind, they are indicators, they are not predictors. Um, so they're just an indication of students of the same age where they would potentially kind of lie uh, using, our, using our data from all those thousands of students who've done these assessments. And as, as we mentioned, again, just in terms of the, the reports, they will also provide uh, strategies for, for teachers, again, to support those students so they're aware kind of how to support them uh, in the classroom um, as well. So you mentioned to us about kind of using um, using the, the CAT4 data there previously, but um, a lot of schools will use CAT4 in various different ways. Um, so how have you kind of used the, the, the data and the CAT4 data before? Okay, so I've used it as a, a leader, um, as a department head and as a teacher. Yeah. So as a leader, we can have very interesting conversations with our, our team looking at the CAT4 data. So, for example, if I um, ask the DP coordinator for the grade 11 CAT4 data, uh, then we can look, first of all, at career options, right? subject choices. In fact, I only recently had a conversation with um, our head of careers. We're now going to be looking in the MY5 CAT4 data because they're having to choose their DP subjects. And incredible how valuable this data is. I mean, I recently had a student um, who teaching and knows well, who wanted to go to a top league university, was, was never going to get there. So I had um, a conversation, a careers conversation, let's put it. And then we also discussed these Cat 4s. These Cat 4s were 95, 94, all the way through. Um, and he quickly realized himself that actually he might not make a, a top level university, although he had a wonderful personality and will probably be a millionaire in the next few years because of his charisma. Uh, and I, you know, and he was a great artist and he designed the school uniform, but he wasn't going to make it to Manchester or Sheffield or, or anywhere like that. So that's, that, that's a really useful aspect of Cat4 in, in the higher years. I've used it in departments so for example looking at cat four across grade levels mm -hmm. uh, and discussing intervention so where um, some classes might need some intervention particularly in primary you might find that there are a lot more spatial learners in some classes a lot less in others etc so you can discuss it with uh, grade leaders and form teachers and i've also used it as a teacher but also as a cover teacher um, and throughout my career, uh, you, you have to stand in, right, as, as head or as head department or as teacher, you have to go and cover a lesson. And where I've been able to access CAT4 data, so I quickly say, can I have the picture of the CAT4 data for this class? Immediately, even as a cover teacher, I can create learning activities very, very quickly, just off the top of my head, right? These guys are spatial. Can you design something? You're going to give me a presentation. You guys go and... Uh, do me a report, something like that. So that's the impact. Uh, and, and the reason for this is because of the ease to which you can access uh, the data. Um, people that don't like numbers, and there are a lot of teachers that hate numbers, there's no doubt about it, um, they just need to look at the pictures, right? A lot of the artists, right? I'm sure you're one of them, an artist. They look at these SASs and they think, whoa, 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 whoa. But then they look at the chart and I say to them, just look at the green shaded area and what's above and what be like. And they immediately, because they're, they're visual learners and they've got it straight away. I mean, it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, the other thing for people that are meticulous teachers, I've used the reports. So they say, right, we've got the data, what do we do? As soon as they start reading the reports and they click on the student and they see actually there's lots of recommendations here, wow. I didn't think about that. Um, the reports are written so wonderfully user-friendly that it, it gives a, a, a teacher's ideas. Yeah. And then the parent reports, um, if you do share with parents, honestly, in my experience, I have never had a difficult conversation with a parent when the CAT4 reports have been in front of me. They know their kids. It's just they're in denial. But when we start discussing using the data, 
they have this wake up call and say, actually, you're right. That, you know, my, 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 my son's always loved sports and art and can never cope with management and can't organize himself. So, yeah, yeah, you've got a point there. How can we help him? So that's some of my experience. Great. Perfect. And you mentioned obviously about the the, the teacher reports as well, and, yes. and and helping inform those those conversations. Obviously, when doing the, the Cat Four assessment, you can generate those teacher reports. Um, you can, if you wanted to, include the the grade indicators that are generated in those reports as well. Um, but just just a, a little bit about those those conversations with those parents, then, uh, Dr. Tassos. Yeah. What, what, what the I mean, look. First that, of all. Another benefit which we haven't stressed is the CAT4 data is available immediately, right? Yeah. So we can, yeah. you don't have to wait for an exam result. You don't have to wait months. So you do the CAT4, you can have a parent uh, conversation the next day, yeah. right? And um, you see, 99% of all the CAT4 data that I've experienced in, in many, many years, and uh, I know that Kate, that's why KHJ took it on board, is in line with their attainment. So when I look at teacher predictions, um, almost always they're in line um, with, with the CAT4. The parents can regularly, and in the Middle East and in India as well, be in denial, thinking that their child is much more gifted than you know they want them to be a doctor or a dentist. Um, and it's those conversations that make it easy. And of course, look, if they're still in denial, then let's repeat it. And I've had situations, well, okay, still don't trust it, let's do the NGRT. Okay, let's also do the progress tests. Yeah. So the more resilient parents that still fail to deny, well, you know, I mean, all this data can't be wrong, right? So it's a tough conversation. Yeah. Um, and it sometimes can be quite hurtful for parents. On the other end, it can be incredibly enlightening. So the quiet child who has always been quiet, perhaps underachieving, you suddenly see the fantastic potential. Uh, the parents have always got them to study every night, lock up in their room. And they're a spatial learner. They're quite kinesthetic. Uh, they're perceptive, but the parents give them to do tests all the time. Suddenly, they see the way of unlocking uh, and having good discussions with their with their children and allowing them to express themselves in different ways. These are ideas that we as educators can teach the parents on how they they can also maximise their child's potential. Because if they if they're above one two five or one three at thirty one forty in some areas. You know, the first thing I say, your child is actually gifted. You know, help them, help them unlock their, their, their gift, their potential. We have some children that are verbally gifted, not so not so good at the other batteries, but verbally, they just, you know, they're the ones that hands up straight away, they want to answer all questions, right? <laughs> Use that energy. Um, so with parents, I mean, there are challenges, but honestly, parents know their kids. That's that's always on our side. Yep. So it's just accepting the fact that actually, yeah, you're right. I've known my child. My child has always been like this. What can we do to help? As soon as they say, what can we do to help? Then you form the partnership. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, just, to, just to give a quick example of kind of using that data, you know, if you had... For example, maybe a couple of students like uh, Josh and Lim here who were the same age um, and maybe have a similar profile kind of in your classroom. They may struggle, both of them struggle to answer teachers' questions. They may have a reluctance to read um, and read kind of independently. So on the surface, they may seem kind of very similar uh, and maybe you might group those, those two students together. But if the students then take the CAT4 uh, assessment, what it may show you is, is some interesting information. So here, both of these students had a low verbal SAS score, so below average, a score of 79. And for, for Joshua here, his other SAS scores were very low as well. Whereas Liam actually had very high SAS scores for, for each of the other three batteries. Um, something that we see quite a lot of in, in international schools um, as well, 
So these two students would need kind of very different support. And obviously that Cat4 data and information can, can help you with that. Joshua here will need kind of learning support generally kind of across the curriculum. Um, whereas Lim here, he's a very able student, uh, obviously from his, his other three scores, but his English is hopefully going to develop quite rapidly. Um, and the Cat4 data allows you to gather that information on those students. Have you got any quick examples, Tassos, of where you've seen the benefits of Cat4? Well, yeah, even, even in the short time here, I think that myself and Tiki you know, have seen some really good examples. But um, uh, I, I found by looking at IDP data, there is a little bit of under attainment because of, of the verbal. So the scores have been 30 to 36 in the last two years, right? And when I've looked at their Cat4 data, we've got students that are getting 140 and 145. Um, but the verbal is low. Yeah. So they should be getting DP results of 40 to 45. Um, and so those learning conversations are beginning already. Um, so we're going to start from MYP5 now so that we can catch them um, early. Again, um, I've also seen where teachers have used it. Um, and it's early days yet because it takes time. To, to impact the teaching and learning but where teachers have used it they've actually changed their teaching methodology hmm. Partic particularly MYP and DP where it can be particularly DP where it can be more didactic they get, they've actually started to personalize tasks for their students and enabling the non-verbal students perhaps more support and more time to do um, let's say extended essay or presentations and particularly in supporting with extended essay if you're weak verbally if you're weak verbally then you're going to have a problem with sentence completion etc so those students can actually raise their attainment on their extended essay or any project style work very very quickly so yeah we do even in the short time that we've started it i think we've seen some some evidence right yeah, yeah. Great, perfect, thank you. And, and that kind of leads nicely, I know you mentioned there about the NGRT, and that leads me nicely onto our NGRT um, assessment, because that might be something that you do alongside the CAT4 or after you've done the, the, the CAT4 uh, assessment as well. So the, the NGRT is our standardized and adaptive reading test. So just going back to Joshua and, and Lim. So with these scores that they have, um, obviously, Joshua kind of needs support kind of across the, the, the curriculum, whereas Lim here, hopefully will his English will develop uh, quite rapidly. Um, but is it just that Lim has English as an additional language or is it an SEN need? Does he suffer potentially from dyslexia? This is what kind of we need to find out and need to know. So the NGRT kind of doing that assessment next will, will provide that further bit of detail and information uh, and where to kind of go next. Now, what we would do with some uh, a student like Lim is look at the verbal SAS and the non-verbal SAS scores. Um, so what we would calculate is what we call the verbal deficit. And that's a good indicator of students need for, for EAL support. So we look at those two numbers here and if there is a deficit, so with Lim here score of minus 60, that's, that's a big difference. So here we need to have a look and do some further investigation. Um, is it just that he has English as digital language or is there something else um, there? And obviously the, our targeted um, support will obviously help Lim therefore access the, the, the curriculum. So as uh, Dr. Tassos mentioned before, the NGRT, uh, again, it's our another standardized uh, assessment that we offer. It is curriculum neutral, just like the CAT4 assessment. But with the NGRT, you can test that up to three times per year, um, which, again, is good if you want to look at progress and see if your interventions that you've done in your school have had an effect on those students. So just very briefly, just to kind of look at the, the NGRT and what it, what it looks at, what it assesses. So we first look at the, the sentence completion, uh, which looks at word and kind of uh, sentence level uh, questions, looks at the, the vocabulary and kind of basic grammar. Um, and then if the students perform well in those section, in that section, most students will probably go on to the passage uh, comprehension, which looks at a range of comprehension skills. 
if the students don't perform as well, maybe in the sentence uh, completion, kind of that lower category, they may be, then move on to the phonics section because the passage comprehension isn't appropriate um, for them. And then you can understand which areas of phonics they understand and where there's gaps uh, in their knowledge. So with the NGRT, Tassos, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned yeah. a bit about it already, but but I know you're very passionate about literacy. So yeah. what, what, why is it, why do you think it's, it's really important and, and, and why use it, you think? Well, look, I mean, we're talking about 21st century skills all the time. So we're talking about research, application, critical thinking. Yep. Um, and many of our students in international schools, or even in India, where English could be the first language, but may not be spoken at home, yeah. right? If I'm right. And so what usually happens is when you come to sentence com completion and passage retrieval and using that information to create oracy and literacy and talk about it confidently, um, this is where we see enormous gaps in students where English is not their first language uh, completely. Because although they speak English, mm. um, they're not able to use the skills that are required of critical thinking, analysis, evaluation, and reflection to uh, present themselves properly. I'll give you an example. Um, we did we did a, this at Edubridge in Mumbai actually, and um, we did a case study. You'll be able to have a look at the case study where we looked at NGRT. We did it three times per year, and we identified the deficit students, right? Cap four, the ones that were below expected, and we put in a rigorous intervention program, mainly on when they're reading to speak about their reading. It was it wasn't intensive we use things like drop everything and read but drop everything and speak about what you're reading drop everything and discuss with your partner what you're reading so they're able to retrieve information and discuss it um, and have access to it and we increased the amount of time they were able to present themselves orally and we saw tremendous progress uh, tracked by GL on the NGRT um, enormously in, in just one year. Because particularly where there is a deficit, because these students are sometimes identified as learning support students, like um, one of the, I can't remember his name, but the chap you mentioned there, he had a deficit of minus 60. Yeah. And with that kind of intervention, rapid intervention, um, quickly, you might find he's not even dyslexic. You might find that he speaks, you know, Mandarin at home, never has discussions other than in school. Very, very bright and academic. So that intervention allows the uncapping of, of um, you know, his potential. Now, you might want to dig deeper here as well, because you might say, well, how about their English? Is this an EAO problem? And this is where I would also recommend taking it with a progress test in English. So if you took the NGRT and the progress in English, then you've got a very, um, I think, good measure of whether it's actually a language issue or a perception issue. In other words, they might be very, very skilled, um, but if also their English, in terms of progress in English, which is benchmarked against I think English National Curriculum and other curriculum, Cambridge, etc. If that is below, then you would need an intensive EAL program because their cap four might be high. It might not just be perception, sentence completion. It might just be that their English is very, very low. So honestly, I think I do feel passionate about it that in international schools, if we're going to accept children of different cultures speaking different languages, we're going to present them with English examinations, uh, the first language English, and the IB, the IGCSE, are meant for first language English students, then we really need to get them at expected, at least for their English and their literacy and their oracy, so they can have the same chance of achievement um, as the first language English students. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, we're all we're all teachers of literacy, aren't we? No matter what subject that you teach, we're all we're all teachers of literacy, and it's obviously really important because 
without without that, you know, students aren't going to be able to access the curriculum, no matter what that is, whether it's whether it's English or whether it's even in maths um, as well. They need they need that. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, in terms of some of the things you mentioned, again, just following up on that as well, um, what you will find with the with the NGRT, very similar in terms of the CAT4 reports there as well, you will also get a standard age score. Um, in the reports, you will also get a, a stay nine score as well. You will also get a, a reading age, which gives you kind of an instant picture of um, who is reading in line with their chronological age as well. Also lots of other useful bits of information in terms of the national percentile rank, which shows where the students are compared to kind of the, the national group picture. Uh, and kind of the other key bit of information kind of to the right hand side there is the uh, stay nine scores for those two parts if they complete the sentence completion, the passage comprehension uh, sections there, because as we know, uh, reading is very complex. It's a complex skill and, and, and children develop at, at different rates. And I'll mention those two areas just a, a little bit more uh, just in a minute. The other thing, again, with, with the NGRT, uh, it will it will look at improving attainment because um, a study that we looked at kind of a few years ago, read all about it today, just a study that we looked at um, shows there is a significant correlation between kind of reading ability uh, and GCSE results across all subjects. You can see kind of the correlation here. So where you've got a score of uh, 0.7 and above, that's considered really strong, uh, a strong uh, correlation. And then between 0.5 to, to 0.69 is, is considered moderate, but statistically significant. Um, so even in subjects like maths here, this obviously has a strong correlation with their reading ability and their GCSE scores. You can also look at measuring progress uh, with the NGRT. So you can do up to three data points um, and that will obviously have a look at in terms of your literacy interventions and um, whether they're having an effect and whether the students are actually making progress. So again, it will give you those SAS scores at those uh, different data points. It will give you their reading age, their stay nine scores for sentence completion and passage comprehension as well and see if they're making progress um, from, like I said, the interventions that you put in place. Just like the CAT4, it will provide uh, strategies and suggestions for teaching and learning. Again, with help, obviously, teachers understand and support those students in the classroom as well. It's not an exhaustive list, but there obviously are some here that you can have a look at and pick up and, and potentially use in the classroom. You can also look at and analyze uh, and understand the comprehension skills. So within the reports, you can look at a detailed analysis of the responses by question type uh, in the individual reports. So for example, here uh, with this student, you might look at their particular score for uh, inference and deduction, where here there were um, seven questions and the student only answered two out of those seven questions correctly. So that gives you a bit more information to do what to do next. So that's an area to focus on for you as maybe uh, as a teacher in the classroom or potentially across a group and a department to look at uh, and focus on for the students um, in your class or in your, in your cohort as well. And as I mentioned before, the, the stay nines to the far right for sentence completion passage comprehension, it identifies those discrepancies between the two. So you can see here the students highlighted in blue, there is a discrepancy of two stay nines or more, and that would be significant and that would be something to look at further. So I mentioned obviously a few ways to use NGRT there. So how does it help you as a, as a leader or even a teacher? Yeah, um, so the NGRT you can see again, it's a very quick snapshot. So it's very, even if people don't like data, they can clearly see which students are well below, right? So that that is a telltale straight away. If I'm doing lectures in first language English uh, and my writing is, and my reading and, uh, you know, is for first language English students, then immediately those students that are below, you know they're not going to access, you know they're not going to... Um, understand and usually in my evidence they're the children that misbehave so if i'm speaking to you in chinese for 10 minutes 15 minutes an hour lesson after lesson after lesson 
obviously your behavior is going to be affected and you know it's only the most resilient students that will not misbehave uh, because they're just not getting it or understanding it and not being um, able to so very as a school leader you very quickly if you do it for the whole school you can identify staffing how much support you need for language support language intervention very very quickly so you look at the whole staff, you look at all the children that are below expected, and you say, well, this warrants three or four additional te teachers, right? Um, the progress measure that you just showed is magic, because in the, in the, in the, even in the diagram that you just showed, if you can just flick back to it, is it possible, Peter, the, yeah. the chart you just showed? Right. If you look at the, the progress one, the, the one before, the progress one, Right, so if you look at um, some of the students here, so for example, student 140, yeah. plus 12, 115, 125, plus 10. Yeah. That's that's the progress, and that's real. Yeah. That's the progress that you can make in a term. All right, and um, if, by the time you've taken your NGRT, you can continue to keep making progress until it stabilizes. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, now that we're teaching, uh, more 21st century skills, critical thinking, inquiry, um, application of knowledge, um, etc. This is going to become more and more useful, um, particularly in answering questions in the examinations. Because if you can't um, understand, reframe, reword, and put forward a new argument, you're never going to access the top 40 to 45s in BP or the A's or A stars, however gifted you are. Doesn't matter if you're one forties, you know, uh, quantitative or spatial. Without that language, and the NGRT helps the um, progress in English, you're never going to be able to access the top grades. That's my experience. That's great, thank you. Um, and kind of following on from that, obviously you've got you've got that information, you've got that data, whether it's the Cat Four NGRT progress tests. Um, a lot of schools what they want to find out what they want to know about is what's what next um in terms of that data you know what do we do with all that data um and what we're always trying to kind of improve and, and develop content for, for our customers and i just wanted to highlight just a quick couple of things um with the cat4 and ngrt to help you to support that data so for example we don't actually just have this for cat4 but we have interactive support guides uh, which you will find on our GL uh, support page, which is highlighted here. And uh, if you download this, it will provide you with further training, uh, strategies for learning, as well as other links to all the free training uh, that we offer at GL. So that's the first thing I just wanted to mention. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is the reading support pathway. So with those uh, stay nine scores for sentence completion and passage uh, comprehension, um, with those final two columns, um, it's this is how the, the reading support pathway came about. Um, it was through kind of conversations with schools that, that wanted to look at this in a bit more detail. And the reading support pathway, it's an interactive pathway, is a tiered response to your NGRT data. So it looks like this. And you don't even need to have purchased kind of the NGRT to access this uh, as well and have a look at it. Um, and it aligns kind of those two core components um, uh, of reading. So what you could do is you could have a look at a student, for example, like, um, like Charlotte here. And if you have a student who has similar scores in terms of their stay nine scores for uh, passage, for sentence completion, passage comprehension, you could then click on Charlotte here and it will provide you with a student story and some potential next steps for that student. And even direct you to the SEND guide if you want to have a look at further potential assessments like our YARC assessment for those students who maybe got a low passage comprehension score. So there's just a couple of things um, I wanted to, to highlight um, with obviously what to do with the data next. We'll come up to final thoughts just in a second. Um, just a, a, again, further, just a couple of things to mention, because obviously you mentioned this just before, um, Dr. Tassos. So in terms of the, the case studies, there's lots of case studies on our website. One that you mentioned in terms of um, the uh, one at Edubridge that you did, that is available there for you to access. And then the other thing to mention, obviously, 
you, you talked about before in terms of those combination reports. So whether it's progress tests or whether it's NGRT, you can have a look at those, those combination of scores. So here you can look at the CAT4 verbal SAS score compared to the student's attainment uh, for the NGRT score and see if they match or using that ability data from the CAT4 alongside the attainment data of the NGRT and seeing if that is expected progress or less than expected progress. And you can identify those students. So we, we, we've, we spoke a bit about kind of those, those two bits of core, uh, those two core assessments today, and obviously your thoughts uh, and, and your knowledge and your where you've used those before. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, in terms of questions, does anyone have any questions? I'll just quick look at the Q and A. We've just got a couple of minutes um, just before we finish. So let's just have a quick look. So just a, a one quick question here. Um, how, how quickly do teachers who haven't used these tests before adapt to them using them in the classroom? I don't know if you can quickly answer that. Look, I mean, it's instant because, um, first of all, the data is instant and it's very user friendly. So any qualified teacher will understand the concept if they're a qualified teacher. Um, also, the less data, the better is possible with GL because you can just share the, the snapshots of the data, which shows the profile of the student. Um, so within five to 10 minutes, we can have really good learning conversations that can um, embrace, the teachers can embrace and change the way their learning objectives are uh, framed so that the evidence of learning that they're receiving can benefit all learners. Yeah. But very quickly indeed. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and just uh, just following up from the, obviously we've got the par parental reports before, do you do any kind of prep with them beforehand? Do you inform the parents about those reports? Do you give them some information about what they mean beforehand? Yes, we definitely do that. So prior to the exam, uh, I mean, a test, uh, we inform the parents via email and all the information that is required. And post that also, the reports are shared, parents' reports are shared with the parents. Sometimes we have one-on-one -on -one meeting with them uh, uh, to understand the details. Yeah. We also did a presentation with the parent groups yes. where yes. we explained, Joe, we had an open discussion forum. And this is quite interesting because... You will find that some some parents will bring up competitor tests and things like that, uh, which are nothing like GL. So it takes quite a lot of good discussion to show that actually the competitor tests are not what the cognitive ability test or GL is. So it's good to involve the parents because, you know, these conversations are very, very useful to have because it it's only with that conversation that you will get the confidence from the parents. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I think that pretty much brings an end to our to our webinar today. Um, thank you both for, for being on this on this webinar and and having your insights has been, I think, invaluable. So th thank you so much for that. Um, we also had just a, a point about, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Rabbi from Dubai Gem Private School. Um, oh, said, yeah, said um, thank you for, for your uh, exceptional performance and thorough explanations uh, today. So, Ravi, thank you. Yes, so yeah, th thank you all. Uh, thank you for all for for attending today, and, and thank you again, Dr. Tassos and teacher, for 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 being on this. Um, just the final thing, just to to mention before we go today. Obviously, we are we do run kind of lots of seminars, and we do try and uh, try our best to to visit as as many uh, countries and schools as possible. And we do have some upcoming seminars. Um, uh, in in Delhi, in Bangalore, in Mumbai, and Colombo on those dates. So if you are free, it would be great to see you. So do sign up on our on our events page um, uh, that you can access there. And if you do have any questions from today, or if you want any further information about our assessments, please feel free to contact either myself or the the international email, and, and we'd love to kind of speak to you and, and respond to those queries. So thank you very much. Thanks again. Uh, Dr. Assos and teacher there, really, really useful today and I, and I hope you found it useful as well.